Welcome to the Contrarians, and tonight we are looking at our favorite year in the 2000s. We're going to look from the 2000s to present day, but we're going to do that in five albums. The panel's here, the panel's ready, let's get started. Contrarians, and tonight we are having a special episode. Well, you know, they're all special for God's sakes. But tonight we are going to talk about our favorite year in the 2000s. So we're going to do that in five records. So just think about that for a second. Favorite year in the 2005 records. All right. I'm sure it can be done. I kind of checked out in the 2000s, but evidently these two guys, they didn't check out. But we're going to talk about that and see what their picks are. And just have a general discussion, and we should have some people showing up later that are a little bit late, so we're just going to wing it. But uh, hey, I want to welcome Andy, and I want to welcome Matt. Both have been longtime Contrarian members, so welcome, gentlemen. How are you? What is going on? I'm great, Grant. All right. Looking forward to it. Well, I wish I could go clockwise, but there really isn't a way to go clockwise here. So does anybody here want to start off? Doesn't matter. Andy, you want to go? Yeah. All right. Alphabetically, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, we'll go alphabetical. That's I'll the stop. way you do it. All right. Well, thanks, Andy. Nice to see you tonight. Thanks for coming Likewise. on. Likewise. Um, yeah, I was uh, torn between 2006 and 2007. And I thought of those two years because um, I feel like they were the last years when I was really still buying a ton of CDs. And um, and I was also listening to a lot of um, XM radio and getting turned on to a lot of stuff, mostly on their uh, quote unquote left of center channel, which was sort of like new, I don't know, indie rock, alternative rock, whatever you want to call that. Um, and I was listening to a lot of Pandora as well. And uh, so, yeah, I was just getting turned on to a lot of stuff. I was really excited about a lot of new artists and buying a lot of hard copies and I, I feel like the the buying of the hard copies kind of um trailed off after 2007 so anyway i'm going to do 2007 my first pick is mia kala um this was this was her really big blockbuster album really she had um a debut album before it that was kind of an underground sensation but this is uh this is the one with the song paper planes that was kind of ubiquitous for a solid year at least here in new york city it was everywhere um she is a um, kind of sri lankan slash uh british uh, troublemaker rapper um and uh she's got a handful of uh producers uh helping her on this album switch diplo uh, Black Star, Timbaland. Her music is sort of um, uh, it's sort it's sort of a chaotic global melange of influences. It is based around beats and samples, but it's kind of got like this um, really colorful world music quality to it. There's a song on here called um, "Mango Pickle Down River" that's got Abor Aborigine rappers. Um, and, you know, she's pretty punk rock as well. I mean, she, uh, you know, famously sampled The Clash on um, on that song I mentioned earlier, Paper Planes. That was a huge song. Um, she she quotes Roadrunner by The Modern Lovers in the uh, intro track on this record. Um, on the subsequent record, she, she uh, samples Suicide. So she's definitely got like, um, I feel like her, her influences are people like, the Clash and Salt and Peppa and uh, Public Enemy. And she's very political, at least on this album, maybe not so much on the first album. But, you know, I what I love about this music is it's um, it's really kind of hard to describe. It, it kind of mixes uh, South Asian music with Bollywood and hip hop and all this kaleidoscopic stuff. I mean, she recorded this album all over the world and um, and she sneaks in these, uh, you know, political. She just sneaks in political content and a lot of kind of, um, uh, kind of prickly sonics. So it kind of 
it, it, it sort of works as pop adjacent and it, and it was a very popular record. And she, you know, she was even on the, um, what was it? The Super Bowl with Madonna. She sort of appeared there with Madonna whenever that was, I don't know, a few years later. So she was a really visible character, but um, she, she's a really contrarian type person as well. After this record, she made a really confrontational, noisy album called Maya that I love. That's maybe my favorite album of hers. But anyway, um, I, I just love when an artist can get into the mainstream and then sneak in all this um, uh, subversive stuff like punk rock and lyrics about real stuff, capitalism and poverty and class struggle and all this stuff that just gives the music more heft to me and makes it less fluffy. And uh, she's rad. I love M.I.A. I'm, so, I'm sad that she's not making music anymore. But that's my first choice, M.I.A. Kala. It's named after her mother. Crazy. Oh, cool. How cool is that? All right. Thanks, Andy. Let's throw it over to Matt and get his uh, next pick. Thank you, Grant. So we did a, a, a similar topic before we were kind of doing our um, any year in five records. And for that one, I picked 1972. So I'm, I'm going a full 30 years later uh, for this one to uh, 2002. So that's the year that I am picking. And uh, my first choice is going to be uh, this one, which is uh, the classic Sea Change by Beck. Um, I'm the wrong person to put this album in context for the rest of Beck's career. I really only listened to this album and then his um, later companion album, uh, Morning Phase, are they really the only two that I, I listened to. Him. But you know, from what I understand, these are uh, different from the rest of his catalog. The songs are predominantly acoustic, guitar-based. Um, lyrically, they were, I guess, uh, they're, they're sort of uh, melancholy and bleak and I guess inspired by a, a, a betrayal and a breakup. And um, although they have the, you know, sort of a, I guess a sparseness in some ways because they're being that acoustic guitar base, but there's a lot of other instruments and, and various instruments across different songs. And, uh, but never like, uh, it's sort of weird. It's very like at the same time intimate and expansive. It's a great um, headphones album. Uh, sounds really good. Um, and al although lyrically it's sad and it's very sort of melancholy in tone, I actually just find it. It's almost like more hauntingly beautiful than it is sad. I don't. I don't get sad listening to it. It's it's uh, a bit more of a uh, uh, just a feeling of uh, sort of weird like. <laughs> expansiveness into uh one human's uh experience and uh it's it's moving but again not in in a uh, a real sad way uh so uh, big fan of the uh the album and uh my very first choice then is holy crap that's a good one well since we just i want to welcome jamie laszlo and david to the show uh, but I'm going to go because, well, I told you in the beginning that the 2000s, I kind of dropped out. But I will mention this while these other two gentlemen are getting ready, and then we'll jump over to them. Um, to me, when I think the 2000s, I think of the band The Darkness, and I'm a big Darkness fan. I buy everything that comes out. I'm on board. But Permission to Land from 2003 and One Way Ticket to Hell and Back from 2005 are, I think, just great records now when one way ticket to hell came back i thought that there was a bit of a slip in the quality of the band but once i listen to it now you know after time has passed i think it's absolutely brilliant that's where they had roy thomas baker back i mean it's a perfect combination of queen the darkness the and sweet it's just great bombastic it's fun you know justin hawkins is great he's an acquired taste some people might not particularly like what he does but i do i thought when that came out in 20 when permission to land came out in 2003 i was totally on board so that's what i'm gonna go with but uh anyway i want to welcome these two gentlemen down below jamie laszlo and dave hey how are you gentlemen i hey, totally forgot about this show guys i did a big f up that's and right. i didn't even prepare i thought this was way in the future well you know in the here in the the contrarians things are things happen so i'm <laughs> going to throw it over to i'll let jamie regroup david are you ready to go 
I think so. Yeah, I'm prepared. So All I'll right. dive right in. So we're looking at favorite year in the 2000s, 2000s to present in five records. I kind yeah. of broke the rules because I jumped many years, but I'm trying to fill in space. We don't want dead air here in the Contrarians. That's not so, surprising with you, right? Breaking a couple of rules along the way. That's what I do. <laughs> so anyway, let's throw it over to David and get his thoughts. Go ahead. You're up. Yeah, next. thanks. Thank you, guys. So uh, apologies for the tardiness, but uh, no, you're all right. So my uh my approach might be a little different than others uh in looking at the 2000s uh you know originally when i saw the topic i sort of was thinking the aughts like 2000 2010 so mm -hmm. when i first started to look i was looking at that decade in particular and then i reread the you know our, our you know the title and i saw we could go kind of to current but really you know when i was researching and kind of thinking i was kind of looking at that first decade and there's a lot you know being sort of a, an 80s guy and there you know is the 90s a lot of it was sort of lost on me um but a lot of the bands are coming back around by the 2000s and there were a lot of new bands coming on board that were good but also some of the classic bands were starting to put out some good 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 new music right so they were starting to produce again and maybe a little bit of time a decade to figure things out some of them had disbanded completely and some of them had maybe put out a record or two in the nineties with mixed results. I mean, you know, some of them are, they're, say they tend to be and, and nothing is absolute, but a lot of the classic bands, the, the nineties offerings, once you get past like 92, 93, you know, they are uh, kind of a mixed bag. I mean, the, the, most of them are outliers in the catalog. Some of them are good, you know, for what they are, but a lot of them are really outliers, you know, to the rest of the catalog, whether those bands are just trying to, keep up with the trends or figure things out or whatever. Um, so getting into the, you know, kind of looking at that first decade, I sort of sort of zeroed in on 2006. And um, part of it was sort of the return of, of you know, several uh, classic bands that I grew up with I, that I'm into that or have been off the scene for quite a while. And so the first one was Whitesnake. So Whitesnake had not had really anything new since 97 97 coverdale releases restless heart which is really as everybody knows is sort of was it was intended to be a coverdale solo album um you know the record company says hey yeah put the white snake logo on it so you sell more but it really <laughs> is kind of an outlier in the catalog and then he also has the i think it was a japanese only release the acoustic thing he did with vandenberg stalkers in tokyo which is super cool um you can now you can find it here in, in the box sets and different things but the times you know, kind of an import only thing you had to kind of kind of dig for here in America. But so nothing had happened and in, in Whitesnake land for quite a while. And then 2006, he releases um, this live in the shadow of the blues. So this is a live album, um, but also has um, a handful of new tracks. So it, it has it's a double disc audio only. Um, the reason I picked this one was because it was also recorded in 2006. Uh, so you get a lot of live material that covers the purple catalog, but also pretty deep into the into the White Snake catalog. It introduces really the new lineup, right? So this is the first time you're seeing Doug Aldrich, the first time you're seeing Red Beach kind of in, you know, something, you know, physical on a, on a White Snake record. So it's, to me, really, it had been what, nine years since Russell's Heart and lineup change. Uh, and so I went with this as my first one. Now, also in 2006, they released this, which is a DVD and with, an, with a companion CD. And it's, uh, oops, I don't know what I'm doing here. It's uh, the uh, live and still the night. The reason I did not go with that one is because it was actually recorded in 2004, released in 06. Um, I went with this one because it was recorded in 06 and, and then released toward the end of the year. So um, that's my first uh First selection, White Snake, kind of been off the radar for a while. Our first taste of Aldrich and Beach and the the killer lineup. So second choice, I'll get off the uh, the metal metal bandwagon just for a second. So my next choice was David Gilmore's On an Island. So Gilmore had been off the radar. I don't think he had a solo album since, criminally, the, uh, the About Face record in 84. Yeah, like 83, 84. Some point so it had been a long time since he put out a record. So as a solo artist. So the On the Island record really is a return to Gilmore, you know, it was 22 years, my notes say, since a solo record. So um, what an awesome record. Everything you'd expect from a David Gilmore record, you know, the songs and the, the guitar work and everything you'd expect that to be, all the adjectives, I won't waste anybody's time, but what, just a phenomenal record. And 
you know, later we get we the Live in the Dance, which is a, a live album on, you know, uh, from the uh, On the Island tour. So, um, yeah, my second choice, I won't belabor the point. Everybody knows what Gilmore sounds like, but this is, if you don't have this, that's a gem. So another good release from 06. What was the opening track on that? Remind me. This uh, it was like, or, uh, or it was like the second track. It was killer. Yeah, the second track is the uh, the title track, but the first track is yeah. Castell Horizon. Yeah, and then I haven't listened Island. to that record in a while, but yeah. I dug it when it came out. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful record, and uh, yeah, definitely a highlight. I think of 06. So is that like the first pressing of that that record you uh, got? I think so. I don't know. Um, it's not it's not a reissue. Uh, okay, that's what I've got. Colored vinyl or anything. I believe it's the first uh um, that's the one i've got yeah. yeah it's a gatefold double album gatefold really beautiful mm -hmm. packaging it's really really well done yeah. for for an era that wasn't really pressing records all that much it's a it's, it's nicely done all right cool david awesome jamie laszlo or can you give me two or you need another minute i can give you two all right give me uh, two yeah, I was just sitting there. Uh I'm still hungover from last night. I saw a band last night. I'm sitting what do you there mean watching, hungover? What watching. Happened? Oh man. Where did you know. go? Where did we have time? Where'd you the, go? The Rumba you? Cafe on uh Summit. Street Who was across. playing? Uh, uh three stoner bands, one called Wizard, one called One Thousand Mods, mm -hmm. and one called um Valley of the Sun. So it, it was nice and small, but I drank a lot, and uh, oh, I was there goodness. with the owner of Use Kids, and we both drank a lot. Oh, my. So, yeah, I was watching Shaggy DA from 1976, just zoning out to it, and you, I got the text, are you coming on? And my heart just sunk. Shit, there's a no, show okay. there that I need to be on. Being a professional like you are, I was really surprised, but I knew there had to be I a know. reason behind I it. I know. I should have wrote a post-it when I said I was going to do the show, and I did not. That's all right. You're um, here now. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to cheat just a little bit. And I'm going to pick this year as my favorite year. But here's the thing. I'm not really cheating yeah. because I set a record this year with it. Where are we? It's September 19th right now at this taping. Yes. And I have already bought 43 new releases, mostly from newer bands this year so far. And the year's not over yet. And there's a lot still coming out. So that is a record for me. As I, I, I'm doing more than one more than one a week so in a way this might be the best year <laughs> because i'm just bombarding myself with new music this year and the two i'm going to start off with i don't know uh i'm really addicted to ripple music which is a record label that does this people call it stoner rock or desert rock it's just good hard rock to me you know it, it sounds modern but it but it has that 70s flair to it and a lot of these bands just rock and it reminds me a little bit of like 1991 when music to me was really interesting with the Nirvanas and the Pearl Jams and Sound Gardens and Alice in Chains and Nine Inch Nails. This Ripple music really reminds me of that time. It's exciting. Saw a band last night that's on Ripple music. And I, I told my buddy, this reminds me of like the early 90s and late 80s when maybe you would see Soundgarden at a very small club. This is what it reminds me of. And it's exciting to me. So I'm going to pick two Ripple releases ripple music releases one is called tidal wave the lord knows which is uh really good um they got a song on here called pentagram which is kind of like it sounds like the band pentagram and if you like just you know sabbath style music that jams even a little bit quicker at times tidal wave and this one i just got into and i've been listening to it a lot it's the band's called fire down below low desert surf club and again, Ripple Music, again, that stoner rock, but it's not music that you're going to just sit there and, you know, get stoned to. It's party music. Excuse me, music. This is just, it's kind of drinking music. It should be called drinking rock because that's what, <laughs> if you want to slam beers. And, and the band I saw last night, Valley of the Sun, is very much like this too. That's probably why I was slamming those damn white claws down my throat white so, claws my yeah god, because beer Jamie. gives me a headache in my older age my god so i'm switching white, to white claw. claw you don't mention that on the air i know i know it's such a such a wussy drink <sighs> and it's embarrassing to order it but i don't get a headache the next day okay i, I do get a little hungover i got a lot hungover today but the headache isn't there okay, so I'm straight god. in looking like a wuss 
for not having a headache the next day. Okay. So those are my first two. And excellent. Yeah. All right, let's throw it over to excellent choices. I'm glad you're you were able to rally and you're not in too bad a shape. All right, Andy, let's throw it over to you. What's your next two? Okay, doing two. All right, so well, uh, yes, what is it? Six thirty. Yeah, so we yeah, can okay. wrap it I'll up at two. seven. So uh, just to recap, I picked 2007. My number two is Justice, their debut album. Sometimes it's called Cross. It's kind of a self-titled. Ooh, there's a ticket stub. Um, yeah, it's got a big cross on the cover. So sometimes they call this Cross. This is a French electronic music duo. I consider them heirs to Daft Punk. I think this album is the most exciting electronic music release since Daft Punk's first album way back in... Uh, 97 yeah and uh it's just a radically mixed um uh, kind of overpowering maximalist dance music record um i did some reading about this album today and i first of all i'd heard that they made this record on garage band which is just a a free consumer grade uh digital audio workstation that comes with all mac or all lap apple laptops yeah um, so it's like anybody that 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 has a that one of those laptops has GarageBand. So um, yes, yeah, sort of an entry level thing. But it's what's cool about the the fact that it was or or the factoid that it was recorded with GarageBand is that it just feels very homemade and and punk rock. But it sounds absolutely amazing. Um, it's packed with micro samples that are like sort of undetectable. Apparently, they used something like 400 albums of source material to collect their little audio snippets from um, with stuff as varied as Queen and Slipknot and 50 Cent and all kinds of people. And you'd never be able to trace where these samples are from because they're tiny little slivers. And there's all kinds of digital clipping and stuff in there that just sounds, um, it, it gives it a rawness. Um, apparently this was a, intended to be an opera disco concept album i don't know anything about that most of it is instrumental but they had a song called d-a-n-c-e which was apparently um a tribute to michael jackson it's got sort of an effervescent cute uh mm -hmm. chorus to it but most of it is is sort of just radical um high impact kind of proto dubstepy uh dance music and it's just, um, it's really loud and fun and uh, it's sort of a sensory overload. And they were really good live too. They really know how to, they know how to, uh, to sequence a set for maximal um, audience enjoyment, much like Daft Punk, who are also masters at that. So uh, Justice, that's my, my, my uh, number two from uh, 2007. How about Rasheen Murphy? So Rasheen Murphy, I think I talked about on another video on, on the Contrarians in the past, maybe favorite favorite female vocalist. She was the lead singer of Moloko. Um, this is her second solo album. It's called Overpowered. Um, this is sort of, um, if you think Kylie Minogue with um, just a little bit of extra quirkiness, a little bit more intellectual heft to it, um it's just an electro disco record but it's just like sumptuously recorded and she's just such a velvety singer um she's got like a, a handful of producers on here with her including richard x who i'm a big fan of um she's a really charismatic performer i've seen her live she does a lot of costume changes really wacky outfits um, if you want to sample this uh, this record, check out the uh, title track. The video is outstanding. It's called Overpowered. Um, what else do I have to say about this? Movie Star is a song on this album that kind of sounds like um, if you've ever listened to Gold Frat, it's kind of similar to that vibe, but it's really kind of a traditional disco record with 2007 production values. And uh, it's not overproduced. Her voice is very human. It's not auto-tuned. Um, she's a proper singer. And I love her. Rasheen Murphy, Overpowered. That's my, what is that now? My third choice. That's your third. 2007. Yeah, that's your third choice. Yeah, cool. Excellent, excellent. And I just want to say, everybody who's out there watching and listening, all this is 
these guys are giving their favorites from the 2000s. Hopefully we can turn you on to this stuff. So keep an open mind. These guys know what they're talking about. And hopefully you can get turned on. Let's keep start an open up. browser on YouTube and YouTube what we're saying and try it out. Pause us. Try it Pause out. Pause us. Come back. But don't turn it off. Don't turn it off. But yes. All right, Matt, what you got? What's your next two? So as a reminder, my year was uh, 2002, and where my first one was uh, Mellow with uh, Beck Sea Change. The uh, my next one is Higher Energy, um, which is the Odyssey by Symphony X. I couldn't find a CD for it, but I, I do have a shirt to show at least. So we have some sort of a visual for this one. Um, this is you know they're a uh, like a, I guess you call them a progressive power metal band. Uh, led by Michael Romeo, who's the guitarist. He's like a neoclassical shredder. And uh, this record was recorded in his home studio. Uh, it's my favorite of all their albums. Um, and uh, it, it's it is kind of bold. So it, it, all, all the songs are great, but it closes with a 24-minute uh, title track. And that, I mean, that's pretty audacious, right? It's uh, Homer's Odyssey that it's <laughs> based off of um and uh th they really pull it off so that uh 24 minute track it has no lulls it's very cinematic michael romeo is credited with orchestral keyboard and, it, and parts of it almost sound like a movie soundtrack and it goes through different um moods it really does take you on an odyssey and then throughout both that song and the record the uh, singer is russell allen who's one of my favorite uh, hard rock singers he um uh, does a great job uh harmonizing with his own voice with in kind of like a i guess a brad delp sort of way but he also can sing with uh, a lot of grit and so he's able to pull off sort of the especially in that odyssey track the uh different mood swings with his voice at the uh matching what the music goes through so uh that would be my uh so the second one i'm showing would be my number four if we're counting down and then my uh, number three choice would be uh, Vapor Trails by Rush. Oh. Um, this one is the uh, remixed and remastered version that came out later. And a lot of people had problems with the production and I guess the band did as well. So it did get remastered and remixed. Um, but frankly, at the time when it came out, it did, the production didn't even really bother me. Oh. Uh, you know, it was the oh. first record that uh, came out since the death of Neil Peart's uh, daughter and wife and you know the band had kind of been on hiatus for a while and uh you know i just find that that sort of the um i guess circumstances kind of hang over the album quite a bit some of the songs um are directly lyrically about neil peart sort of dealing with those circumstances and things like ghost rider and how he you know, rode his motorcycle uh, all over as he's dealing with this unfathomable tragedy. Um, but not all of the lyrics are, are about that directly, but I do find that it just sort of hangs over it. And, you know, Geddy Lee has had to be an interpreter of Neil's words throughout, you know, the, the whole career, you know, since after the first album. And I think about what it must have been like for him to have to interpret his bandmate, his friend's, um, lyrics that he's writing in these circumstances and mm -hmm. I think he does an amazing job I think the vocals are really strong on this I love the way the different harmonies that he does on the record and it, it's almost like even the songs that are not directly about the tragedy it's almost like because uh, there's some kind of like more big bigger picture um, lyrical ideas in it and it, it almost feels like you know um, Getty sort of passing along some sort of greater wisdom through Neil's words that come out of this this tragedy and uh, in a way there's sort of a comfort that I find in listening to the to the album uh, so that is why it's my number three choice Rush's Vapor Trails that's good so which version do you like better the the, re the remix, oh, the remix much better it's just I, I found that the, the the songs were great and um you know, there's no keyboards on it um and uh i think they're all just all really there's a um, lot of hooks in it it's it's heavy when it's um you know you can hear the acoustic guitars better on the remix so i definitely like that better but uh you know the, the first version was great too i loved it when it came up i thought it was a mess who was it was it who was the producer pete henderson i can't remember no uh um, who was it they should be they should have been hung but 
I, yeah, I guess don't want to say that he, he had done on some other record. Yeah, but you know, what the right? hell happened? It's all his fault. Everything was jacked up into the red. It sounded yeah, it the, distorted. The, the, the loudness wars, right? And, uh, yeah, but the digital distortion is horrible. Analog yeah. distortion's fine, but digital distortion just sounds bad. And that record sounded bad. But I mean, they were able to calm it down a bit. But Sweet Miracle is a great song. Maybe they need to use that technology they used on the Beatles Get Back, where they could take all the individual tracks. Maybe they could wipe away all the distortion now with the software. I don't know. Maybe maybe it's time for a third remix. Anyway, that's a good choice, but I could go on a rant on this whole album, so that's a whole other thing. Let's throw over to it, but thank you, Matt. Excellent, excellent, excellent. David, what's your next two? All right, so number three, I'm going to dive back into my sweet spot, which is the eighties. And, uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to pick a band that, um, I, that again, like white snake have a pretty big gap. Right. So and that band is Europe. And so Europe, at least in the United States is known for pretty much one song and is not considered to be, to have a ton of value in terms. They're not really, you know, they're just another hair band, I guess. And I'll use the hair band, but in the United, at least in the U S I know in, in no pun intended in Europe and other places in the world, they're much, much bigger band and their cattle, their, 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 their catalog is much more well received. And, but here, you know, and they haven't toured here, I think in probably seven or eight years and, and it's pretty sporadic. And they, again, here they're known for one song and uh, it's, you know, it's the song you'd expect. And I think they're kind of bundled with one hit wonder hair bands. When in actuality, Europe as a band has a pretty high level of, of uh, uh, musicianship and the songs are fairly complex. And, you know, while they are certainly of the 80 year, 80s era uh, and fall into that category in a lot of ways, I mean, John Norum, phenomenal, um, you know, and the band and interesting, you know, even, you know, throughout to current, they've maintained the same lineup uh, in spite of the long break, you know, how many, there are too many bands that can say that. I mean, that have maintained, you know, the same five guys. Well, I, I say, with the obviously norm left for a while but when when they and they had uh key marcello for a couple records so i'll i would think with that caveat to know that america is everyone watching is gone you're wrong but so without that you know everybody i in spirit you know be easy on me in the comments but uh it, it went you know when the band sort of took a break so after uh i guess the uh prisoners in paradise record uh which would have been like 90 gosh 91 ish um uh anyway 91 yeah prisoners in paradise the band sort of took a break for the 90s and came back um in 2004 with an album called start from the dark which was all the original members you know and uh since then they've put out six records uh and the last one being i think in 17 uh the walk the earth and the really i would say their second act is better than their first act as much as i enjoy the the 80s and early 90s europe you know this band is it's heavier the songs are more complex um you know joey's voice is on point he's not one of these guys who can't sing and is kind of you know trying to tone him along and has not lost a step and norm is top form you know uh, and but still melodic heavier a little darker but also very melodic and so in 2006 sort of their second record from the return i guess from their 11 year hiatus of being europe was an album called secret society so i'm picking secret society as number three um a little bit more melodic than the predecessor start from the dark um and if you like europe and you're not familiar with the work that they've done since 2004 you've got i think six albums to choose from and i've got them all it's phenomenal i would argue that it you know like i said before that you could make the argument that it does none of it sounds like the final countdown and it's not there's no carries or found countdown on there which i don't hate but for those that do this is different if you like heavy sort of not not metal heavy but hard rock melodic hard rock you know and you're looking for something check out you know the 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 europe catalog from 2004 to present i think you won't be disappointed so my next that one was secret society um was my third choice um my fourth choice um, I'm going to go with, again, a lot of bands 
a lot of, you know, people listen differently. And a lot of times for nostalgia purposes, they get off the bandwagon with certain bands at certain times. You know, I tend to, you know, uh, continue on board with new releases. And in 2006, um, Iron Maiden released A Matter of Life and Death. So I happen to like this record quite a bit. Um, it's a uh, like the third record uh, marking since uh, the return of Bruce Dickinson and Adrian Smith. Um, I like it better than its predecessor, uh, which was Dance of Death, uh, which I think was released three years prior. Um, and you wouldn't get another Maiden album for, I think, three or four years after this with Final Frontier. Um, while the production is a little on the muddy side, it, it to me, it's a Maiden record. I mean, if you like Iron Maiden, it's, it, will it ever have the nostalgia that you felt when you listened to Peace of Mind or Power Slave? We will not, um, because it's all about time and place. But, you know, uh, you know, I'll listen to Power Slave four to one over this one, right? It's on the later record, just because where my nostalgia lies. But you know, the, A Matter of Life and Death is a solid uh, uh, Iron Maiden record. Uh, and like I said, for a band that has continued to produce new music, uh, this record sounds like Maiden. And it's, you know, a little prog little more progressive. Some of the songs are longer. They get back to a little bit of that. Um, like I said, my only knock on this thing uh, with uh, Maiden is the production. I feel a little bit on the muddy side, but that's more personal taste. So number four for me, Matter of Life and Death, uh, Iron Maiden. Super. Excellent. All right, Mr. Laszlo, what you got? What's All your right, next we got, two? We got 14 minutes, so I'll try to be fast. Well, we'll, we'll do it. Um, So, you know, in the early 2000s, I was a little lost in music. Uh, <laughs> I, I was a little lost. Uh, it wasn't really until I found a band like Mastodon and I started going down that avenue that I felt like I was back on track. But I was listening to Avenged Sevenfold in the early 2000s. And, you know, they were kind of hit and miss. They started off as metalcore, metalcore. And then, you know, they always had that emo thing going on. And then they tried to become like traditional metal. They started to lose me on Nightmare in 2010. Hail to the King. It was just a bunch of copycat songs. You could tell what song by what band they were trying to copy on the particular song. Uh, that was 2013, 2016, the stage. It sounded to me like the band read a book called Prog Metal for Dummies, how to do a prog metal album and just went through the motions. So when they did, uh, when, re when they released uh, Life is But a Dream this year, I was like, ah, you know, I'm done with them. But it's really good. And people are comparing it like to Frank Zappa. I wouldn't go that far. It, it has a lot of ideas. Each idea in itself is not that crazy. The way they string the ideas together in one song is kind of crazy, though. But, uh, yeah, and I tell people when I listen to this, I I'm back on the A train. I I'm down with Avenged Sevenfold again, so they won me back. And for my next one, I'm going to go with, I think, the best. I mean, I I mean I'm very picky about death metal. I've heard a lot. Of death metal but i'm very picky and i think this is the best they're my favorite death metal band of all time and that is horrendous with their new album what the hell is it called on tall on tall on on ontological mysterium that, that i think i i think i spit it out hold on a little water i'm parched guys that name of the record just says please buy me that's all on, i'm gonna say ontological mysterium I don't know. It kicks uh -huh. ass. Okay. And I got the CD. I got the vinyl on the smoked vinyl. This is what I always assumed death metal could be. They're doing everything I want death metal to be. Super creative. All kinds of layers in the music. There's parts that I swear to God I can dance to on this album. The vocals are... Well, you know, you're going to get death metal, but it's not, you know, he's not singing from his toes. It's it's lighter and and, and it's a little bit back in the mix. So it's, the vocals aren't like killing you. I'm not saying people who don't like death metal will like this. But if I played you a bunch of death metal and you had to listen to it, you mm -hmm. go at least play horrendous for me that I can kind of stomach. So, yes, great guitar playing, great bass, uh, bass playing. And just super creative ideas on this album. So cool. there you go, horrendous. 
Excellent, excellent choice. All right, cool. And you're Andy, just you, saying that, Grant. You would oh, I, you. yeah, I have no idea about death metal. I you couldn't. You're talking to like a, a a wall here. But you know, I'm trying to be supportive for God's sakes. All right, Andy, what's your uh, last picks? All right, well, I don't have a hard copy for this one, but it's Deer Hoof and their album Friend Opportunity. Again, this is 2007. If you don't know this band, how would I describe them? They're sort of um, kitchen sink indie rock um kind of whimsical vocals mixed with really sinewy musicianship chamber pop funk noise proggy elements uh, kind of like early blonde redhead there's a fly that's been I've after got, me all day i've got the blonde um, redhead cd like it's got like a light blue cover where i can't remember what it's, it's called but... like an early blonde redhead yeah little motto kind of vibe mm -hmm. um yeah, their songs just kind of turn on a dime. They have this, like, let's try anything kind of attitude. And it's just incredibly entertaining and free music. Um, and uh, what's my last one? Oh, so, yeah, I have a hard copy for this one. This is Grand National, A Drink and a Quick Decision. Now, there's an American band called Grand National. Don't get it twisted. I'm not talking about them. This is a British band. It's essentially a duo that kind of meld i would say you know this is 2007 i would say that they access everything great about british rock and pop and electronic and new wave music of the previous 40 years so you get everything in there from squeeze to blur and uh you know whatever new order the police there's really all kinds of stuff going on it's traditional musicianship guitar bass drums uh keyboards some electronics mixed in but it's never really electronica per se it's more like indie tronica or something mm -hmm. um you know all dance maybe you could call it they have a song on here called by the time i get home and it is an absolute all-time immortal classic rock song i want everyone to listen to that song if you don't listen to anything else um some of the other things i mentioned today are pretty quirky um, but Grand National, I think that it's amazing to me that they weren't a huge band, um, like Oasis huge. Um, okay, so I think that was it, right? Um, some honorable mentions, Chemical Brothers, We Are the Night, the first uh, St. Vincent album. Susie and the Banshees, one and only solo album, Manta Ray, fantastic. Uh, the Shins put out an amazing indie pop record, and um, yeah. I, uh, I've, got, I've got that Shins album on vinyl. It's a good oh, one. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. You have excellent taste, my friend. That's good. Well, you know, I got some of it. You guys are all over <laughs> it. All right, Andy. Awesome. Great choices. Yeah, I haven't heard these, Jamie. I know. I'm just saying that. All right, Matt, what's your next two? So my top two choices from 2002. Mm -hmm. First up is uh, Opeth's Deliverance. I'm kind of glittery there. Um. So this is um, sort of in a sweet uh, spot for me in their career where they're you know, definitely still combining the uh, death metal with, uh, sorry, Grant, with um, prog rock. And, uh, but in kind of that mid to later period where uh, they are uh, have really good pr production on it, um, but still have the death metal vocals uh, combined with prog rock and clean vocals. So uh, Michael Ackerfeld, the, guitarist, songwriter, singer of, for the band. He's got a you know great voice, really versatile um, in, in kind of the both of the styles uh, of music that you have on this. This record was uh, recorded at the same time that they were recording Damnation, which I th think came out five months later, which was all mellow prog songs. So it's just this period of unbelievable creative output that they're doing all this. Uh, yeah, all of music. One. Nice. Yeah, that's a, yeah, exactly. They put it together later. There you go. Um, you know, uh, at one time putting all this uh, music out together. It's really uh, fantastic. Uh, Stephen Wilson from Porcupine Tree is assisting with the production and doing some vocals and other instrumentation on it. And I guess Porcupine Tree needs uh, an absentia would be an honorable mention for me for 2002 as as well. And um, I, the, the, and the songs are all, you know, 10 minutes plus. They uh, change pace throughout the uh, 
musicianship's phenomenal. And uh, the, the title track, Deliverance, there's a, a riff in there that uh, is just one of my all time favorite riffs. It's really heavy. It comes in the middle of the song and then and then it comes back and they beat it to death at the end. And um, I, I just love it. So that's my number two choice, Deliverance by Opeth. Sorry for the glare. And then my uh, my number one choice, and, and this was easily my number one choice, um, is Remedy Lane by Pain of Salvation. Um, I think Pain of Salvation to me is, uh, you know, for me, the most important band uh, that's produced, uh, released music in the 2000s. Um, and this one is at the top of the list for me, for them. So I guess I'm staying in Sweden. So like uh, Opeth, they're a uh, Swedish band. I guess you would call them a progressive metal band, but they they don't sound like other uh, prog metal bands. They sound like themselves. Uh, led by Daniel Gildenlo. He's the singer, guitarist, songwriter for these. He has a um, really amazing voice, very versatile. He can uh, do very uh, heavy um, sort of, he's not a death metal style vocal, but, but with, a, with a lot of, you know, grit and fire, uh, then the most beautiful singing, a lot of range, really amazing. Uh, this is a concept album of, uh, I guess, self-discovery. It you know, appears to be semi-autobiographical. And if you look at the liner notes, it has uh, place names and dates and photos. It's almost like you're looking at a scrapbook. And it is um, very personal and haunting. It has, um, for me, the most heart-rending song I think I've ever heard, which is A Trace of Blood. Subject matter is about a miscarriage. Um, it, it's just a heartbreaking um, song. And uh, and there's periods of that throughout the album. The name of the band is Pain of Salvation, and they're aptly named because they can go between that sort of dark and light and sort of show the horror and the beauty and the beauty and the terror um, from both sides throughout all of their music. They're truly progressive. They change styles throughout their um, career. And, um, you know, I, I love this record because it's got, um, you know, all these extremes, there's like time signature changes, they juxtapose rhythms throughout the syncopation, and has a lot of complexity, but it never reduces the emotion. It's such an emotional record. Um, and so to me, they're a true prog man. Um, I think that uh, Daniel Gildenlow is a true artist, and this is one of his masterpieces. So Remedy Lane by Pain of Salvation. Cool. Excellent. All right, David, what's your uh, last choice? All right, briefly, I'll try to be brief. So uh, I wanted to go sort of deep and off the deeper uh, and off the radar for my last choice and maybe turn some some viewers on to something they may not be aware of. So in the late 80s, uh, you know, I was turned on to a singer named Robin McCauley, who um, is Irish and had sang, sang with a band called Grand Prix. And then was, I think most most notably did some records with Michael Schenker. And uh, so I really liked his voice and singing and he sort of was off the radar for the entire retirement of the 90s right uh like a lot of artists you know had to go into the private sector and pull a paycheck for a while so uh while while, while, while grunge happened in some other styles right it more didn't really align with a voice like robin's right so uh in in 2006 he released in 99 he released a solo album called business as usual um, and mostly uh, an import, and so it didn't really fly on the radar much in the United States. But um, And then in 2006, which is my year, uh, he did a project called Demon Angels. So uh, it's the one-off uh, album. It's been re repressed and reissued, so I think you can maybe still get this on um, Amazon pretty cheap. So uh, I think this is the reissue. So this is still out there and available. Um, it's a one-off. It's melodic, hard rock. If you like Robin McCauley's work they did with Shanker, the Macaulay Shanker stuff. You like his voice, um, you know, check this out. Um, he, uh, in 2001, I think there's a, another one-off project called Elements of Friction, which is a little bit better than this one with Ricky Phillips. And um, and that's a little harder to find. It's, a, it's another one-off. Um, it's melodic hard rock. But uh, if you can find that one, pick it up if you see it in the bin. But for my year, for 2006, if you're a fan of Robin Macaulay and his voice, uh, and uh, melodic hard rock, and you can uh, you can grab yourself a copy of this. Like I said, I think it's still available, you know, on Amazon, pretty cheap. So definitely worth checking out. Um, Robin McCauley, Demon Angels for number uh, 
for my uh, my last choice. All right. Super. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Jamie, what's your last one? Um, real quick, Baroness just released this stone. I haven't had a chance to really digest it, but the few times I listened to it might be their best record. Um, Blood Ceremony released a record this year. Really good. I ranked their albums on Sea of Tranquility with Pete over there. If you want to check it out. Um, but my number one choice, I'm going to go with uh, Old Mind Universe, This Vast Array. Uh, I stumbled upon it on Bandcamp. I talked about this album before on The Contrarians. And I said, if you remember in the late 80s, early 90s, music was starting to change. It was going to make a big change in 91. But you started getting like Sonic Temple by The Cult was popular. And Danzig's first two albums. And then you had like uh, Steve Jones, Fire and Gasoline. And a band like Steve Circus Jones. Power. Yeah. Things were getting a little grittier. And then Nirvana hit. This sounds like right before the never mind, mm -hmm. all that kind of music. And it, it would fit right into 1990 perfectly, 1989. And I love it. And why did I bring this up again, though? Because when I talked about them on the contrarians, I sent them a message on Facebook and I said, Hey, I talked about your record on uh contrarians. Um, Martin Popoff runs that channel, and I talked highly about your record, and they were like, Great. And then they sent me this Sweet. A new sweatshirt. So this is what I wear in the fall when I take the dogs out to poop. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really cool. And it was really nice of them. So wow. I wanted to say thank you. So if you guys ever talk up a band, send them a message, and maybe you'll get something free. That's good. That's words to live by there, you know? I'm still waiting for Pat Benatar to send me a kiss in the mail from that two hour ranking show I did on her album. Did you let her know? Yes. Did you get a response? No. Maybe you need she's to talk to Neil. She's, she's a busy woman. Maybe you need to talk. I'll to let me. it slide. Everything goes through Neil. She can just kiss a napkin and mail it to me. It may happen. All right, gentlemen. Well, like I said, I hope someone gets turned on by these recommendations. At least go out and check these bands out that these gentlemen are recommending. And like I said, that's all we do here. It's just about turning people on to music. And it's all about getting together and talk music. That's what it's about. But anyway, I want to thank Matt, David, Jamie, and uh, Andy had a split. He had a thing at seven. But what a great discussion. I'm so glad all you guys could join us. And uh, yeah, in my pajamas. Fun. Hey, you got to, you know, a man has to be comfortable. You know, I don't judge. So, all right. If you'd like to be on these panels, we do have a uh, Patreon. You could be on here. You could suggest topics. You could be on a panel, for God's sakes. If, if that's too much for you, we do have a Kofi where you could buy us a pint or buy us a cup of coffee. That's cool, too. Or you could just give us a dono. We even like that. You know, we'll do whatever we need to do to do what we have to do. But anyway, we do this because we love it and we just want to turn you on to music. So what's next on The Contrarians? God only knows. But there's way more on the way. So I want to thank these gentlemen for coming on. And let's wrap this dog up. We got let's a live one tomorrow night, remind people. Oh, let's throw that out there. Tomorrow, well... I'm just going to say every every week, at this won't be ready tomorrow, every week, Wednesday, 7 p.m., we do the Contrarians live chat. So check it out. We have constant, we'll have different topics every week, but we'd like to see you in the uh, chat. We let, love the interaction. We wouldn't do it without you, so we'd love to see you there. So uh, based on that, thanks, Jamie, for the plug. Yeah, keep I'll, I'll be there for that show. I'll be be there for that. So, all right, everybody. We'll see you. Think, see you, gentlemen. And we'll see you on the next one.